Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for watching today's service. We pray it's a blessing for you and your family during this time. Uh, I did want to give them a few, just really one quick announcement before we start today. As you know, we are approaching graduation season, and well, honestly, this is one of the most unprecedented graduation seasons we've ever had. But if you want to reach out to our students who are graduating, we have actually a very large group this year. And if you want to reach out to them with a card or a gift or some type of thing like that, just contact the church office. We'll give you the information, you know, names, numbers, addresses, so you can reach out to them and their families and be a blessing to them in their way. Like I said, this is the weirdest graduation I can think of in recent history, but we still mm-hmm. want to support and honor and love those families who have come to this really important milestone in their kids' lives. So just let us know if you want to reach out to them. But Pastor Mel, why don't you tell us a little bit about what to expect in today's sermon? Yes, this morning we're starting in Revelation chapter 2 in a study of the letters to the seven churches from the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, to those churches there in Asia minor and of course this morning we are uh, d- dealing with the church at Ephesus and the, the Lord's uh, concern with that church was that their love had grown cold so how do you overcome a love grown cold that's what we're looking at this morning yeah super excited I'm really looking forward to this series I love looking at the churches in Revelation seeing what the Lord has for us there so it's gonna be an exciting study and yeah. also Matthew here in case you haven't noticed is on crutches he had a surgery last week ACL on his right leg yeah. and uh, that's been repaired and so uh, he's he's uh, somewhat out of commission yeah. but somewhat in commission and oh, yeah. uh, you know, we're, we're gonna pray for him and uh, be praying for him and uh, pray for him also as he makes his way off the steps that he doesn't fall down and I had to pick him up yeah not much has really changed I'm just a little bit slower these days but that's just a matter of things but <laughs> anyway thank you again for watching we hope this is an encouragement for you so enjoy this service time. God bless. Go. Three, four, five, go. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above. Oh, gratefully sing His wonderful love. Our shield and defender, the Ancient of Days. Pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. O oh, tell of his might, O oh, sing of his grace, whose robe is the light, whose canopy space, his chariots of wrath, the deep thunder clouds fall. Dark is his path on the wings of the storm. You alone are the matchless king. To you alone be our majesty. Your glories and wonders, what tongue can recite? You breathe in the air. Oh, measureless might, ineffable love, while angels delight to worship above. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. You alone, oh, you alone are the matchless king, to you alone be our majesty. Glories and wonders, what tongue can recite? You breathe in the air, shine in the light. Sing that again, you alone. Yeah, you alone are the matchless king. To you alone be our majesty. Your glories and wonders, what tongue can recite? Glorious above, who oh, gratefully sing his wonderful love, our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. Good morning, so glad you're with us this morning. We are here to worship. Our King, to God be the glory, we want you to sing this good old hymn with us. To God be 
made the glory great things he hath done so loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord Praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the prize of God, the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus apart and receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he hath done great things he hath taught us great things he hath done and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son but purer and higher and greater our wonder, our victory, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Who come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, we come together together to gather before you this morning and uh, to give you all glory. And we pray, Lord, that as we do so, that your spirit would guide us and help us to do just that. Help us to honor you, to adore you, to worship you in spirit and in truth this morning as you so deserve to be and as you so desire to be. And as we do this, Lord, we pray that you would use this time to draw us nearer to your throne. Uh, to renew our minds and bring transformation to our lives. And of course, Lord, as we come together with heads bowed before you, we ask that you would continue to make yourself manifest in this world through your church. Continue to show your love to this world through your church. Continue to work as you're doing. And we pray that you would, uh, Lord, use this pandemic, use this time of quarantine to strengthen your people and to cause the gospel to find its way into the further reaches of this earth. We ask this all in Christ's name. Amen. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned in glory the Savior now to wash our feet, now at His feet we bow. The one who wore our sin and shame, now robed in majesty, the radiance of Now shines for all to see. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. The fear 
fear that held us now gives way to him who is our peace. His final breath upon the cross is now alive in me. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. By your Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. In your name I come alive to declare your victory. The resurrected King is resurrecting me. The two were soldiers watched in vain. Was borrowed for three days. His body there would not remain. Our God has robbed the grave. Our God has robbed the grave. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. Your name, your name is victory. All praise will rise to Christ our King. By your name I come alive in the dishes of defeat. The resurrected King is resurrecting me in your name. Worthy, there is no one like you. There is 
come to you this morning and we praise you that we know that you are our rock you are our salvation you are the one that we can build our lives on lord and we just want to give you praise give you all the glory that you do, that you deserve lord i thank you right now that in this time that we're going through lord we need you as a country but we need you in our lives lord leading us and guiding us every day and we just thank you that we know that when you when we call on you that you are there and you hear every prayer that we pray, and you hear every word that we speak, Lord. We give you praise, Lord. We give you all the glory for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I come. I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you. When I cannot stand, I'll fall and fall. 
Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God. Good morning and welcome to worship with First Baptist Church Chapel Hill. If you have your Bible handy, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 2 today. And uh, if you received the bulletin via email and you've looked at that, you will, you'll notice in there it says Revelation chapter 1. But as is becoming my custom, uh, I changed. <laughs> kind of a last minute deal. This pandemic thing has got me all kind of messed up. But we're in Revelation 2 this morning, uh, starting in the letters to the churches. And uh, you, you probably noticed that over the last few years, Colonel Sanders has reemerged in television commercials for Kentucky Fried Chicken. And uh, as you may well know, Colonel Sanders was a real person, and uh, he really did create Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, built it with his own greasy little hands, as it were. And uh, he sold the company in 1964, but he later came to regret that decision because uh, the company just didn't, well, it didn't, it turned out to be something very different than he expected that he planned for it to be something very different than he desired for it to be uh, they began tinkering with his signature recipes and he was very disappointed with that and so much so that in fact he would travel around the country and go to different kfc restaurants and very vocally express his uh, disdain for the low quality of food and the shortcuts were being that were being taken and uh, things became so bad that finally in 1978 kfc sued him uh, the lawsuit was eventually thrown out, but he was very disappointed with what the company had become. And, you know, although Colonel Sanders was responsible for KFC's existence, uh, it really wasn't what he created it to be. And there's a sense in which the same could be said of the church. Although Jesus is responsible for its existence, it isn't exactly what he created it to be. Uh, how far have we strayed from the original recipe. Uh, well, this morning, beginning in Revelation chapter 2, and uh, the letters, we're in the letters to the seven churches, and uh, these were seven real churches made up of real people, real human beings, just like you and me. They had families, they had jobs, they had life going on, all the struggles, all the highs, all the lows, all the pressures of life. And uh, we're going to find in, in these three letters, and in these, these letters, rather, these, these seven letters, that these churches were not exactly as Christ created them to be. And uh, though these letters are addressed to these churches specifically, their message is relevant to all churches in all places at all times because, well, no church is exactly as Christ designed it to be. So look with me this morning, uh, Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7, the Lord's letter to the church at Ephesus. He says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, says this, I know your deeds and your toil and perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I am coming to you and will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. Yet this you do have that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. 
All right, so the first letter is addressed to the church in Ephesus. And uh, in Acts chapter 19, Paul came into Ephesus, and uh, there he found a few disciples, and he began preaching the gospel to the Jews in the synagogue. Uh, he did that for three months, according to Acts chapter 19. And the church at Ephesus was born out of that effort. Now, after some time, there were those in the synagogue who refused to believe, and they started speaking evil against the Christians and against Christianity. And so the Christians moved out of the synagogue, and they moved into a school uh, where they, well, they operated out of the school for two years. And during that time, Acts chapter 19, verse 10 says that all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. So there was, think about it, there was no internet. No television, no newspapers, no mass media, yet the church at Ephesus had somehow managed to impact all of Asia with the gospel. Uh, give you an idea of just how powerful this church was, well, there was a pagan temple in Ephesus dedicated to the Greek goddess Artemis, also known as Diana. And uh, this temple was not a little hole-in-the-wall business or outfit or whatever. This, in fact, uh, this temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and people came from all over the known world to worship at this temple. And there were a lot of local businesses that made a living off the temple. Uh, they made a ton of money manufacturing little figurines uh, in the shape of Diana and the shape of the temple, made them out of silver and sold them to people. Quite a business. Uh, but because the church was such a powerful entity within the city, many people were turning to Christ, and these businesses began to struggle. And as these businesses began to struggle, the business owners began to protest against the church. And if you read Acts chapter 19, you discover that a riot broke out as a result of all of this. And so the church in Ephesus was a powerhouse of a church. It crashed a major center of pagan worship single-handedly. And this uh, this church was making a noticeable and real difference in the world around it. Now, here in Revelation chapter 2, it's about 55 years later, and Jesus has a message for them. And the letter is addressed uh, directly, well, in verse 1 it says, to, to the angel of the church. And the other six begin in the same way, to the angel of the church of Ephesus and Smyrna and Pergamum. And uh, the Greek word translated there as angel is angelos. It's not really a translation, it's a transliteration. The word literally means messenger. And it can be used to speak of a heavenly messenger, uh, which we would refer to as an angel. Or it could refer to uh, a human messenger. And uh, it seems most likely that in this context, it's probably a reference to the church. Uh, the pastor of the church, rather. Uh, many pastors, uh, they're referred to in their church as the messenger. They stand up before the people, and they bring a message to the people from God through His Word. And so it could well be, it seems to me, that the angel of the church is the pastor of the church. Now, as for the letter itself, it's well, there's a distinct structure to it. There's a pattern here that Jesus follows with all the letters. First, He commends them for their strengths. And next, He moves on and He alerts them to a failure, and third, he goes on, he tells them how to overcome that failure, and finally, he gives the solution to the, you know, the, after the solution to the problem, he, he, he announces a blessing for those who overcome the difficulty. Uses the same pattern in all seven of the letters to all the other churches. And uh, we go on, we move into, uh, we look at the commendations. Uh, let's look at the commendations. What is it about Ephesus that finds favor with the Lord. Well, you look in verses 2 to 3, we see that he commended the Ephesian church for three things. The first was that they were steadfast in their deeds. They were steadfast in their deeds. In other words, this was a hard-working church. Many years earlier, the Apostle Paul wrote to them in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that they were created in Christ Jesus for good works. In other words, they were created for the purpose of serving the kingdom of God. And so service was something that they took very seriously. They knew they were saved to serve, and they served. Uh, they, they worked. They worked hard. And Jesus says, I know your deeds. And your toil, word translated there as toil, could also be translated as troubles, speaks of work that's time-consuming, it's work that's exhausting, work that takes you out of your way on the behalf of somebody else, it's work that is sacrificial in nature. So this was a church that would, well, they took the trouble. Uh, they cared. They took the trouble. They went out of their way. And surely there was a lot of the work that they did that they very much enjoyed. 
But there was a lot of it that was just, well, it was toil. It was trouble. It was not so enjoyable. And, you know, that's how working for the Lord is, really. Sometimes it's an enjoyable thing. Sometimes there are things that are involved in serving the Lord that aren't so enjoyable. And this idea that it's all supposed to be enjoyable, well, it's just a very misguided kind of an idea. I mean, after all, I mean, what, I mean, are we supposed to only do the things for the Lord that we like, the things that we find enjoyable, the things that we're comfortable with? Or do we expect Him to stretch us and cause us to be a little bit uncomfortable in some of the things that we do? Uh, the fact is, is that there's a lot that needs to be done in the name of the Lord, and, and so much of it isn't fun. It's time-consuming. It's sacrificial. It does stretch you. It does make you uncomfortable. It causes you to get your hands dirty. It's hard work. It can drain you. It can drain you physically, and boy, it can drain you emotionally. But it needs to be done. Now, many people are willing to serve, but only in certain ways, only in ways that they're comfortable with, only in ways that don't take too much time, only in ways that don't take too much investment, only in ways that aren't too challenging. Uh, they aren't, you know, really, there aren't very many areas of ministry that fit that description when it comes right down to it. Uh, and I think that this explains why statistically only about 20% of the people in any given church are actually serving. Uh, kind of a tragic thing. Uh, and that's strange, really, because we're not lazy people. Uh, we were willing to work hard to support our families, and we should. And we're willing to put forth a strong effort with our jobs, and we should. And we're willing to put forth a sacrificial efforts even with our jobs at times, which is, it's, is understandable. And we're willing to work hard and work sacrificially in a lot of different areas and for a lot of different ends and for a lot of different purposes. And that's good. And that's what makes it so strange that there are so few who are willing to put forth that same strong, sacrificial effort into the church on the behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the church at Ephesus, well, they were a hardworking church, and the Lord took note of it. And that's an important thing to recognize, is that the Lord took note of it. I know your deeds and your toil and your perseverance. You know, some of you labor quietly, rarely ever receiving any recognition for what you do. Some of you work in the background without ever, anyone ever seeing or knowing what you do. Uh, but the Christ who stands in the middle of the lampstand says, you know, I know your deeds. I know your toil. I saw you visiting the shut-ins during the pandemic. I saw you making meals for people who were sick. I saw you mowing yards and doing repairs for people who couldn't do those things for themselves. I saw you whenever you went and brought encouragement to people who were struggling from various ways. Maybe no one else sees it. Maybe no one else even knows about it. Maybe no one else acknowledges it. But Jesus Christ says, I know your deeds and your toil. And in the end, that's the only one who really matters. He's the one who matters the most. And him taking note of it, well, that's where the most value is. So the Lord commended the church at Ephesus for their hard work and also because they loved sound doctrine and they hated sin. Uh, we see this in verse 2 where he says, You cannot tolerate evil men, and you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not, and you found them to be false. And we see it also in verse 6 where he says, You hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So they had no tolerance for bad doctrine, and they had no tolerance for bad behavior. And the Nicolaitans had both of those things going on for them. Now, who were the Nicolaitans? Well, we really don't know who the Nicolaitans were. Uh, they come up again in the letter to Pergamum, and that's about the extent of what's said about them in Scripture. They're not, they're not, not ever mentioned again. Uh, historically, well, the church fathers give some indication that uh, Nicola, you know, well, they, they were the Nicolaitans came out of a group where well, they were a group that sprung from the teachings of a man named Nicholas. And uh, Nicholas apparently began within the fray of orthodoxy. He was a part of the church, but he began teaching some weird things, got ousted from the church, took a little group with him. They became known as the Nicolaitans. 
And because they were mentioned in the letter to Pergamum, we can kind of gather that they might have been somewhat of a widespread group. Uh, we don't know exactly uh, how far their reach was. We don't know exactly what they taught. But we also know that they were very immoral people. Clement of Rome, who was one of the early church fathers, once wrote that the Nicolaitans had the morals of goats. <laughs> they had the morals of goats. Now, I don't know what all is involved with having the morals of goats, but it can't be good. And uh, so as we, as we put these things together here about not, you know, having no tolerance for bad doctrine and no tolerance for bad deeds, well, we can kind of recognize that there's a connection between these two things. There's a connection between belief and behavior. And the connection is this. What you believe will, to great extent, determine how you behave. What you believe will, to great extent, determine how you behave. Wrong beliefs give rise to wrong behavior. Right beliefs give rise to right behavior. This is why the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Allow God to change the way you think. And if you allow God to change the way you think, it will transform the way that you live out your life. Behavior follows belief. Church at Ephesus loved right doctrine, and this fueled their lack of tolerance for sin. You show me a, a church that tolerates sin, and I'll show you a church that's out of touch with the Word of God and has no grasp whatsoever on sound doctrine. That's how this works. Wrong beliefs always pave the way for sinful behavior, always. The church at Ephesus was very concerned about these things. And this is probably because Paul warned them so many years earlier about false teachers. Uh, you look at Acts chapter 20, verses 29 to 31. Uh, shortly after the church's birth, he's writing this. He says to them, I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from your, among your own selves, men will arise, speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, he says, be on the alert. Be on the alert. And the Ephesians did that. They remained on the alert. When false teachers arose, just as Paul said that they would, this church put them to the test. The Lord acknowledges that. You put these people to the test. Well, what's the test? Well, the test is Scripture. Scripture is the test. How well do the things these people are saying match up with the Word of God? How well do they match up? If they match up, okay, we will listen to what you have to say. If they don't match up, you're gone. You're out. <laughs> you're, we're not going to listen to you. That's the test. And this, this church was made up of, of mature believers. They're not spiritual children. Uh, you know, Ephesians 4, Paul warned about you know, deviating from the Word of God and, and being tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. That's not the church at Ephesus. They did not have to worry about this. They were a sound church. They were a deeply orthodox church. They were a church that knew Scripture, and they knew it well. And this is the thing that strengthened them against false teachers and immorality. You know, many Christians believe the right things. They can tell you exactly what those right things are, too. They can tell you that Jesus is the Son of God. They can tell you that He was born of a virgin, that He's God in human flesh. They can tell you that there is no other name given under heaven by which men may be saved than the name of Jesus Christ. They can tell you that he's coming back and he will judge the wicked and reward the, reward the righteous. They can tell you all of those things, but they can't tell you much more. So many Christians can tell you those things, but they can't tell you much more. They can't tell you where the Scripture teaches these things. They can't elaborate on any of these things. They can't articulate why these things are important, why these things are necessary. And unfortunately, if you challenge them on any of it, they can't defend it. It's good to know and believe the right things, but the Scripture commends us to do so much more than simply 
know and believe the right things. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says this. It says, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. And how do you do that? Well, you do it by always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. And you do this with gentleness and reverence, Peter says. Always be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. In other words, always be ready to explain what you believe and why you believe it and why it's so important. And always be prepared to articulate and defend right doctrine. Not only will this make you a stronger witness for Christ, but it will also equip you to recognize false doctrine when you hear it. Steer clear of it. It will also position you to work the sin out of your life. This only happens whenever you make it your business to become a student of the Scripture. This is something we've got to resolve to do, to become students of the Scripture, serious students of the Scripture. Now, for all appearances, the church at Ephesus was a great church, fantastic church. If you were looking for a church, it'd be hard not to be drawn to the first place Baptist Church of Ephesus. There there was a strong, vibrant ministry going on there. There was exceptional biblical teaching and preaching going on there. They were serious about purity. They were hardworking people. What's not to like about all of that? Jesus himself took note of these things and commended them for it. But we see in verse 4 that in spite of all the appearances... And everything that was going so right, there was one major concern. The Lord says, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You've left your first love. Folks, the greatest commandment in Scripture, the most important commandment in Scripture is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. When Jesus says to this church, you have left your first love, he's saying you are neglecting the greatest of the commandments. If the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and it follows that the greatest sin is to not love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. In other words, whenever that love begins to wane, you're falling into sin, serious sin. Despite all the things that they were doing, while their passion for Christ had grown cold. Now you've got to think about that one for a minute. I mean, did you ever know it's possible for a church to have all these things going on that this church had going on and yet be cold in their passion for Christ? It happens. Paul spoke of just such a thing and its results in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that love chapter. He opens it up talking about, this. hey, this is what happens when Love is not uh, the, the, the motivation for everything that you do. He says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I've become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. The point? Without love, whatever you're doing is good and honorable and noble as it may be. It's ultimately worthless. It's ultimately worthless. The church at Ephesus was doing all the right things, but their love for Jesus had become as cold as ice. For that reason alone, Everything that they did was reduced. It was minimized. It was devalued. It became nothing more than just rituals, habits, and duties devoid of real value. Now, how does the love of a church grow cold? Well, it happens when the individuals who make up the church grow cold in their love for Him. It's not something that happens overnight, it takes time. It happens one by one. It's a process. Our church will get like that if you get like that. Are you like that? 
Are you getting like that? How do you overcome it? Well, Jesus gives us the solution in verse 5. He says, Remember therefore from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first. Threefold solution. Remember, repent, repeat. (laughs) Kind of an easy way to remember it all. Remember, repent, repeat. Remember from where you have fallen, he says. Remember from where you have fallen. If you're saved, you know what it's like to have a burning passion for Jesus Christ. To be madly, deeply in love with Him. You've experienced it before. That's why he says, remember. Do you remember what your life was like before you heard the gospel and received Christ as your Savior? you remember what it was like? Do you remember the shame and the guilt you experienced when you first recognized your sin? And did you remember what it was like when Jesus first came in and washed all the sin and guilt and shame away? Do you remember the relief and the overwhelming peace that you experienced when he did those things? Do you remember the joy and the excitement of your newfound life in, in Christ? Do you remember how you couldn't get enough of him back then? When there was a real hunger to know more about him, a real desire to know him more intimately. Do you remember then when there was a real excitement about worship and encountering him in his word and making new discoveries about him all the time? Do you remember how things used to be? Do you remember from where you have fallen? Now, some of us, I mean, you know, our love and passion for Christ is stronger today than it was back then. So that's great. If your love and passion for Christ are not stronger than they were then, well, you need to remember. Remember from where you, remember from where you have fallen. And, and furthermore, you need to repent. You see that every, in each of these letters whenever the Lord points out an issue, the solution is always repentance. It's always, the, it's always part of the solution. Repent. Twice he says in verse 5, repent. The word repent means to change directions. It means to do an about face. Stop in your tracks, turn around, go the other direction. Uh, there's emotion involved with repentance. And, uh, you know, there's a brokenness that comes uh, uh, with that. You know, there ought to be sorrow over sin. There ought to be some grief over sin. But calling us to repentance, well, when Jesus calls us to repentance, he's not just telling us to work up some sorrow. I mean, there's an emotional element to this, but it doesn't just begin and end with the, the emotion. He's calling us to action. All right, he's calling us to action. He's telling us not just to feel something, but to, but to do something. Now, many of us will candidly admit the sin in our lives, but then we sit and we, and this is what we do, we wait around for some sort of an emotional surge to happen before we ever take any real action against it. I mean, and the command here is to repent, not wait. Repent, do something. If your love has grown cold, Jesus says, act on it, repent, go the other direction, do it now. A lack of love and passion for him is sin. It's sin. And again, we're dealing with the greatest command here when we're talking about loving the Lord and failing to love the Lord. And so this is something we need to actively and deliberately deliberately work to turn away from. Regardless of the attention that we give to serving and having right doctrine, a lack of passion for Jesus Christ is sin and it is a grand failure in our walk with him and like all sin again the solution is to confess it turn away from it repent turn away from the sin of allowing everything to become a routine turn away from the sin of reducing worship from an expression of your love for him into an expression of your love for tradition itself Confess it and turn away from it. Remember, repent, and then third in the middle of verse 5 is repeat. He says, do the deeds you did at first. Do the deeds you did at first. Repeat. Go back and do the things you used to do when you were first swept up in the joy of salvation. Nurture the relationship. Get heavy into God's Word. 
Get serious about prayer like you used to. Fall in love with Him all over again. You know, the Greeks uh, had a race in their Olympic Games that was different from all the other races that they had. And the winner of this race was not necessarily the first person to cross the finish line. The winner of this particular race was the one who crossed the finish line first with his torch still lit. Uh, the race was called the Lampa de Dromia. Lampa de Dromia. And uh, this, was, uh, this, this race is partly the inspiration for the modern Olympic torch lighting ceremony where they bring the torch from some faraway place, they keep it lit, they bring it, they light the big fire, and you know, the Olympics commence. Um, you know, I want to finish the race but I want to finish it with my torch lit. It's one thing to finish. It's another thing to finish with your torch still lit, with your love, with your passion, still burning strong. The problem in Ephesus wasn't their doctrine. And it wasn't their hatred for sin. They, they hated sin. They didn't tolerate it. And the purpose for there wasn't that they were lazy. They were hard workers. The, the problem in Ephesus was that the lamp was flickering. The flame of the lamp was flickering. And Jesus expected them to take his warning to remember, repent, and repeat seriously. He expected them to do something about this. He said, turn this around or else I am coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place. You know what that means? You know what he's saying there? That's Jesus saying, I'll snuff out the lamp myself. I'll disband this thing that you call a church. If I'm not the heart of it, it's not going to exist as a church. Well, did the Ephesians heed his warning? Did they have an ear to hear what the Spirit says to the churches? Well, you go to Ephesus today and you... Look for the church. What you're going to find is a weed-covered ruin. Kind of a graphic symbol of the state of Christianity in that part of the world today. Modern Turkey. I mean, that part of the world that was once the very heart of Paul's ministry. It's 99% Muslim today. Same thing is happening in Europe right now. It's been happening for decades now. Where passion grows cold for Christ, the light grows dim, and it eventually flickers out and the lamp stands removed. What about America? What about here? I mean, how are we doing here? I mean, how far have we strayed from the original recipe? What's the state of the church today? Well, the church is welcome to materialism and worship of self into what it does. We've come to view God not as the Lord to love, worship, and serve, but something like a grandfather uh, who's desperate for our acceptance and just wants us to be happy. Church has become less of a place of worship of, the, of the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and a place where His name is exalted, and it's become more of a place where we expect to be entertained and have our personal desires catered to and met. We're not in a good way, by and large, there are lampstands going out all across this country. You know, it's funny, Ephesus, they managed to defend themselves against false teachers and immorality, but they never managed to turn their own hearts back to the Lord Jesus Christ the way that they should have. And Christ kept His promise. He removed the lampstand from its place. So how do we keep the same thing from happening here? Well, Verse 7, he says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, heed the warning. Fuel the fire. Continually fuel the fire of your love for him. That's got to be the top priority. Right doctrine is important. Love for Christ is more important. Hatred for sin is important. Love for Christ is more important. Working hard for the Lord is important. But loving Him supremely is more important. To Him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God, Jesus says. Paradise of God is heaven, and the tree of life is a metaphor for eternal life. So much at stake here. 
And the church at Ephesus serves as a warning to us that there's nothing that can make up for a deep and passionate love for the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing that can take the place of that. There's nothing else that we can do that can substitute for a love grown cold. And so this is where our personal responsibility comes in. The lamp of the church stays lit when every person makes it his personal priority to continually grow in his love for Jesus Christ. So what are you doing right now, lately, during this time of pandemic, this time where life is upended in in upheaval? What are you doing to keep the fire burning? What are you doing to ensure that you're continually growing in your love for the Lord Jesus? I'm reminded of that verse of Scripture that says, Be still and know that I am God. It's funny how God allows things to come into our lives, such as pandemic, that force us into a place where we have no choice but to be still. What are we doing with this time? This is a great time for revival. This is a great time for revival in the church. And there seem to be indications that such a thing is happening in places. Boy, I sure hope this is one of them. Father, I'm so thankful to you for the many ways you show your love and goodness. So thankful for this church, the people who make it up. I thank you, Lord, for the sincerity of the people who make up this body. Lord, we're all human beings. We're all sinful in nature. So there is struggle involved in this. There is a tendency to put other things first and to become focused on lesser important things than loving our Savior. Or my prayer for all of us, for everyone watching, for all of your children in this country and throughout the world is that you would use this time to draw our hearts nearer to your side. Stirring us a craving to see your glory more clearly. And to love you more deeply. Help us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm about to turn it over to these guys for one last song. Before I do, I want to invite you to make a commitment right now. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, from wherever you're watching and listening, make a commitment right now. Resolve today to put things in place, to begin doing things, to stoke the fire, to rekindle the passion for Jesus Christ. Such an important thing. If, you've made, if you're making a decision, if there's a commitment you're making, I want to hear about it. Please uh, drop me a line. My, my email address is pastor at fbcch.net drop me a line let me know what's going on how I can pray for you I'll certainly be praying for you as you make commitments if you've got questions about anything you've heard today or what it means to be a Christian how to become a Christian why it's so important to become a Christian and what all is involved with that I want you to email me or call me I'm happy to talk about those things with you If you're one who's been watching, but we've never had the opportunity to meet you before, we especially want to hear from you, too. We want to have the opportunity to get to know you and minister to you. So why don't you give me a call or email me and let me know that you've been watching and, again, how we can pray for you and minister to you, too. All right. Well, in the meantime, here we go. I'm going to turn it over to these guys, and we'll wrap things up. God bless you. Measureless might, ineffable love, while angels delight to worship above. Thy mercies, how tender, how firm to the end, our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. You alone, oh, you alone are the matchless king. Glories and wonders, what tongue can recite?
you breathe in the air, shine in the light. Sing that again. Hey, you alone are the matchless king. To you alone be our majesty. Your glory is and wonders what tongue can recite. You breathe in the air, shine in the light, shine in the light, shine in the light. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, who oh, gratefully sing His wonderful love, our shield and defender. Ancient of days, pavilion and splendor, and get it with praise. 